You thought I would never get on. Hey gang, I bet you thought you'd never get on. Or I'd never get on. Uh, having a tough time trying to get this live streaming thing to work. So um, tell me who's out there, who's listening. Sorry, I'm so late, 14 minutes past the hour. Uh, I'll make it up. I promise I'll go a little extra over time. Uh, talk to me. Tell me where you're from. I want to answer your questions. And I've got a really, really great subject today. So um, anyone that's on, thank you for being patient. I appreciate it. And we're going to figure this thing out. I can't believe that it could be this difficult. But uh, we've had a few speed bumps in the process. So um, we're going to get to it. So uh, can I get some, a list of some of the people that asked questions from last week? Because um, I want to get to those first. I want to answer you guys' questions. And then I really want to uh, zero in on this very, very important subject of how to make a living doing music. Um, and I've actually done very well for myself. And I've, there's lots of ways to do it. And there's lots of you know different avenues and streams that you... So do we have any questions from last week or no? Let's see what we got here. Uh, let's see here. We have Eduardo uh, uh, Oliveira. question is, can greetings from Brazil, is it possible to belt in mixed voice or can we only belt in head or chest? Good question. Um, there's not one answer to that question. Thank you for asking it. Um, mixed voice, depending on how you know how to grow it, is it spans over several notes. It's not one note or two notes, okay? Now, typically what we understand mixed voice is that it's a combination of your head voice or reinforced falsetto that's really bright that you uh, worked really hard and making it match the tonal qualities of your chest voice. That's the first thing. And then it's where you're talking about belting in mixed voice. So let me just take a typical example for someone like myself. If we're, by the way, for those of you that know notes, uh, note values. So if I say E4 or F4 or F sharp four or G4, you guys have to understand this part of it first. And I won't be able to cover this all of this right now, but on a fretboard of a guitar, if you bring your head voice down really low into your chest voice and you mix down there, yes, it can be very difficult to belt through this area because you over bloat the chords and you're, you're filling them up with too much air and then you're kind of just, you know, there's, they're, they're going to have separation. They're not going to be able to stay closed in, in the way that you want them. If you're up around, and by the way, this is for baritones and tenors, so obviously you can trout those altos and sopranos and, you know, whatever. Um, that's different. It happens at a different range for you. And your vocal folds or chords are a little over half the size. So because they're smaller, they resonate different. So there's a whole different dynamic to this. But anyway, if you're up around a C, C sharp, D, E flat, 5, E5, you absolutely can belt through this area. Uh, and you can mix a certain percentage of this. So it just depends on how much pressure, sound pressure, you're looking to put into the sound uh, and where in the scale, what is your tessitura for this part of the mix voice that you're able to, um, to accomplish this. Now, you can get really good at it and you can bring your head voice down really low and lean into the sound. I wouldn't call that belting. I just call it you know, having a good chest resonance sound that's mixed low, um, then you're not really belting, but you have a really nice, beautiful, warm, round sound in your lower register. Okay. Uh, there's that question. What do we got? I wanted to get to some of these questions from last week. So you don't think I'm just blowing you off. I really sincerely want to answer everything I can. And, but I want to get to this subject too. And I want to make the focus of this. Uh, Marcos Pastor can I have a question. Um, when I'm practicing a distortion voice, sometimes I started to cough. Okay, that's actually very common. And that's because actually you're pinching and squeezing and closing off in the throat. Now, if you followed my course, or at least my tutorials on YouTube, we develop open throat first to keep the throat open first, the tongue drop to the mandible, the jaw, and all these things, elements have to happen mechanically first, otherwise you pinch and squeeze, and then you do exactly that. In fact, I'm going to discuss more about that. Gustavo, what was his name? I'm sorry. Um, anyway, I'm going to I'm going to discuss more about that when we uh, go through um, some of the singers that I want to discuss that are students of mine that um, have gone from amateur status to professional status. So, uh, what else we got here? Anything interesting? No, nah, nothing interesting. Okay, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> anyway, again, my apologies, guys, for being so late. It just took us a long time to get this thing rocking. Oh, and for you that were out there that saw me live stream, actually, that was uh, my associate, Andrew. 
who was trying to get this thing to work. And I guess he was online for like 19 minutes. So you have intimate uh, knowledge of Andrew. <laughs> and and uh, I guess he was surfing the web trying to figure out how to make this thing work. So, um, But we're on now. That's hi, CD from Argentina. Hey, by the way, friend, did you know that we lived in Argentina? We lived actually in Buenos Aires and then in Mar del Plata. And my, actually, my son... Uh, played for uh, the Primavera division of Aldo Civi uh, in Mar del Plata. So anyway, but we'll continue. Uh, my voice cracks when I sing. Yeah, I have a whole uh, tutorial on that. So please look at, at, at uh, my YouTube channel. And again, I cover all of this in my singing course. So if you guys really want to, this isn't just a, a, a vibe for you to buy the course. I really do have killer tutorials in there to cover most of these questions in there. I can hit, hit high notes uh, uh, using my pharynx. Uh, but I sound like a cat being strangled. Well, that means you're not using open throat techniques. You're going it's a, ah, in a way. So um, shout outs to uh, Slinger from Slovakia. We've got Oshan from Oshan Grelanello from Nepal. That's a long way away. Uh, we've got Fran Ib, uh, Ibn Zil uh, from Argentina. Okay, cool. That's who I just talked to, right? Uh, Federico from Uruguay. So we've got these... It's so fun to have people from all over the world and get to learn together. Um, I love that. That's really cool. Okay, listen, I'm, we're going to save some of the comments right now. I want to get into the um, core of what it is that I want to talk about today, and then I'll, I'll I'll revisit some of these questions afterwards. So I get asked this question all the time. You know, I want to make a living doing singing or music, period, not just singing. Well, um, first of all, it kind of depends on where you live because uh, whatever the economy and the market will bear. So we see we have people from all over Washington State, uh, you know, India, um, looking at you know all these different crazy places. Uh, again, Nepal, Mount Everest. Oh, Mount Everest, how cool! Um, but um, the, the, whatever uh, your economy will sustain is important to take all of this into consideration. But, but. I do want to point some things out that are important about that, okay? Here's the first thing. The first thing is, is that how do we make a living doing music? I just want to cover a few students that you guys have seen on my channel, and I don't play favorites. I, I really let the music speak for itself. I let the singing do the talking. I don't, you know, uh, gee, she's cute, she's ugly, you know. I just go, hey, you know, how, how do I, can I see myself helping this artist or this person get achieve their goals. Well, I'm going to start with Tori. And many of you have seen Tori on my channel, and she's awesome. Now, Tori started out working at PetSmart, and I think she was 17 when I met her. She might have been 18. I think she was 17. Uh, went from that to being a hostess at a restaurant. She worked her butt off for like two straight years. And I really mean it. And there's no quick pill to this, guys. I'm telling you. You could do it in a year if you're really good at it and, you know, whatever. But for two straight years, she worked her butt up to the point where, not saying she couldn't have done this on her own, but to the point where it was worth it to me to use contacts that I have to introduce her to other people where she could get a job singing and, and, and doing music for a living. Now she is a singer at a very prestigious restaurant called Mastro's. And there you can look it up, M-A-S-T-R-O-E-S, I think it's um, O-S, excuse me. Um, sorry, Steve Beyer, who's one of the talent buyers for Mastro's. Um, anyway, and so um, she went from a hostess working at PetSmart, minimum wage, to making three or four hundred dollars a night working four to five nights a week and singing only, it says singing only, but working only for four hours per night. Think about that. That's a half day. So she is killing it working at a rice restaurant. And, you know, you have to be good and you have to be qualified. Now, this is also true for another client student of mine, Sarah Loera. You guys have seen her on my channel. Sarah also works at Mastro's. Now, it's a different location. One is in Arizona, where Tori is, and another one is in Los Angeles in Orange County, Newport Beach area. Now, Sarah has been working there for quite some time. Sarah actually makes bank doing it, and she was a bartender. Now, really, <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. She was a bartender at Fred's in Huntington Beach on the pier, off the pier, and she just wanted to be able to do music for a living. 
And from her ability that she did and worked hard for, she actually joined me in a cover band that I had called Ballroom Blitz. And we had all these killer gigs booked and stuff. And I was looking to raise some singers and, 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 and good looking girls to like dance and sing, you know, whatever. But certain people raised, you know, uh, um, rose to the top. But anyway, so Sarah, uh, from going being a bartender, which she didn't love at all, to singing at Mastro's, but not, it didn't stop there. Look at my YouTube channel. Look and see how many hundreds of thousands of views she's earned herself from working hard and meeting guys like David Foster, who produced bands like Chicago and Earth, Wind and & Fire and all these crazy bands to where she actually has uh, been able to break into the music industry in a different kind of way. Okay. Now, um, the reason I'm going through all this is I want you guys to see that there's no one road. It's not like all of a sudden, you know, here's the crystal ball and I'm going to wave a wand over it. And I'm going to tell you exactly how, you know, how you're going to make a living doing music uh, without effort and without brainstorming and with some ingenuity. Okay. But I, but I want to talk about some of the things that I've done. And the first thing I want to address is artistry. Okay. It can be very difficult to be an artist in the music business and make a living at it. But I'm not saying it's not doable and not even discouraging you from doing it. It's what makes us great, what makes us hungry. And we don't want to, you know, homogenize our art to the point where all of a sudden, you know, it's almost kind of not worth it anymore. But so as you, some of you know, I have 40 records out, 40, 40 records out. And I have around a thousand songs placed in film and television. Now, Bob, I think uh, my associate who's actually monitoring this in the description below this video, when it's done or now or whatever, I'm going to give you guys some tutorials. One of them, though, is um, showing you what's called my IMDb. It's Internet Movie Database. This is to show you that it's I'm not just some guy talking wah, 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 wah. It will show you not all, in fact, not even 10%, but a, a lot of the movies I've worked on, a lot of the TV shows I've worked on, and a lot of the things that I've done. I want to get into that in a second because I want to talk to you about placing music in film and television because that's a, a, a good component. And then I'm going to come up and cover, cover some other things as well. Before I go there, though, I didn't get a chance to finish about other students that I've had that have had extraordinary success. Gabriela Gunchikova, you guys know her, the blonde chick who sings her butt off. When I first met Gabriela, she was in a very small village in the middle of the Czech Republic. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up, because I just saw some people from Czechoslovakia, or excuse me, Czech Republic, it's no longer Slovakia, Czech and Slovakia, excuse me, my bad, um, and, and other places around the world of what the economy will bear. They'll say, well, Ken, you know, I can't go join a cover band in a restaurant because they don't pay much and there's no way I can make a living at it. Well, that is and isn't true. Um, so when Gabriella approached me, hardworking gal, very hardworking gal, she was on a show or actually in the middle of a show called Superstar, as some of you know. And Superstar is sort of like their American Idol. I don't want to go into the details of the show. I just want to mention that if you go and look at some of Gabriella's early videos when she was 16, 17 ish, um, she was singing with, uh, I forget the name of the band, but she did like Nazareth, like Love Hurts, for example. Um, and it was called Maryland, M-E-R-Y-L-A-N-D. And she was blowing her voice out every night, every single night. She was killing herself, destroying her voice. Did she sing okay beforehand? Yeah. Uh, did we take her to a whole new level? Yeah. And let me tell you what that yeah means, okay? She came and studied and did my master's class. We worked for three months, actually. It was a long time. Every day, five days a week. It was a long time. And she came, we actually wasn't, she didn't just come once. We kind of spread it out over a year. We got to the point where she was asked from YouTube videos, posting YouTube videos from some of the work that we'd done on my channel to be asked to be one of the lead vocalists for Trans-Siberian Orchestra. Great money. Killer venues, five-star hotels, transportation for days. Everything is just absolutely first class. Then 
she was asked to sing for another extraordinary outfit in throughout Europe through GAS, which is Germany, Austria, and Switzerland, which was um, rock meets classic. You can look it up. Good money, <laughs> killer travel, awesome exposure, working with some of the greatest musicians in the world. And then from there, we went to Eurovision, which she was a finalist and the first one in her country, the very first one in her country after 55 years of them trying to get into the finals for Eurovision. She's the only one that did it because she's hardworking because she put the method that I teach and applied it. And, and she will be the first to tell you this. So she's made an extraordinary living and done very well for herself to do this from a very small country in the middle of the Czech Republic, or a ta excuse me, town in the Czech Republic. I wanna talk about Anthony Vincent for a minute. Anthony's a good friend. Um, I remember him contacting me when he had his first viral video. And I remember him saying, oh my gosh, what do I do? What do I do? I did, uh, it was um, not Adele, it was, oh, it was Katy Perry in 20 styles, I think it was, right? And all of a sudden it just blew up because he applied the technique and he was able to sing all kinds of different things. Not that he couldn't do it before. Anthony's awesome. I helped him a lot. He'll be the first to admit that too. By the way, it's not, this isn't meant just to be an, a, a Ken Tamplin promotion. I'm just saying I have good information and I'm able to get people what they need. Um, so, so all of a sudden he's making six figures on YouTube. Think about that. Right? So I don't care what country you live in. Not everybody's path is the same. Not everybody wants the same thing. Some people like Sarah, she just wanted to get out of being a bartender and do music for a living. Now she's gone beyond that because she's gotten really good. But the point is, is that, so now I want to get into more of the film and TV part of this because I, I backtracked and talked about students. I want to talk about how, what is really required. First of all, there's a tendency to think, I wrote this song, and I just know it's good for some soundtrack out there somewhere, okay? Good luck with that. Artistry is one thing, and we want to espouse to, you know, being the best artist that we can. But if we are smart about it, and Bob, uh, hopefully you're doing this now, but I'm going to post because I have cruise uh, ships and some other things. There is a, there is a great resource source out there. I don't own it, so I'm not allowed to post this part of it, but I do have permission to post some of the cruise ship stuff. I'm gonna put the description tag, but it's uh, it's the Film and TV Artist Red Registry. And the guy's name is Rich Ezra. So look up Rich Ezra and Film and TV uh, Re Registry. And he has killer contacts. You, and by the way, everyone's trying to sell you on how you can, you know, make it in the film and t the TV world or how to make a living at this. Don't buy that. There's groups out there. Taxi is one of them. Um, I, I don't know. I submitted probably a couple hundred songs in my heyday through Taxi, and I never got a single solitary one of them placed. When I got the film and TV registry and I started to call music supervisors and say, hey, what are you looking for? And they say, well, the movie is, is a, it's a period piece. It's a colonial England back in the 1700s. We're looking for maybe some Irish folk or this or that or whatever that is. Don't be thinking if you've got a metal song, you're going to get it placed in this movie. So what I would do is I would call them up, find out what they're looking for, and see if I had something that could accommodate or satisfy what it was. And I did extraordinarily well. In fact, it got so crazy that what I wound up doing was I went up surveying, and there's ways to research this, what were the most popular requested slash songs that were cover songs that were done in film and television. So I extracted a hundred songs, a hundred songs. It sounds like a lot of music, and it is. And I did have the ability to record it in my studio, so I had some luxuries that maybe you don't have right now, but I would say invest into yourself so that you can do this if you really want to do it. And, and, and here's what happened. Here's what I found out. I found out that almost all of these, like I did the theme for Ace Ventura and I, you know, I had the good, bad and the ugly, uh, 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 thing for, um, inspector gadget and like all these different things. But what I found out was in the, in the uh, midnight hour, 
they have a champagne taste on a beer income. And so they want to get all this music wall to wall in the movie as much as they can. And then they go to the publishing company and the publishing company says, <laughs> we want $250,000 for that. And then, and then they go to get the master license. So publishing is usually half of what the master license is. So EMI or whomever Sony says, we'd like a half million dollars. And they're like, oh, right. And they go, we can't afford this. So then they start scouting Facebook and YouTube and all these things to find, are there any cover bands out there that have done a song like this that we could put it in the movie, right? Straight up. So you're going to notice that you've seen a lot of, you know, unknown bands get these gigs. It's because at the last minute, the producer or the music director needed this song. It fit behind the scene. They don't want to go back into Avid and re-edit the movie to some other song that they don't have rights to. So they start hunting down music. So what I did, and call it a genius, call it stupid, is I took the top 100 songs that had been done in film and television, and I tempo mapped them. Now, here's, here's something very interesting for you. By the way, there's a lot of ways to get to make money, but I'm just saying, you know, if you love this and this is what you want to do. The reason that I did this was because the biggest problem that a music director will have is that even if they get a cover song from some band and they fly it into this edited film, the hits aren't there and they're off because they tempo mapped that to the original song that they wanted to purchase, right? But didn't get the song. So what I did, I went in, I got out Acid Pro, simple, inexpensive program. I put a click, I got the original out, I put a click and I tempo mapped the entire song because it, they didn't, most of these songs they didn't do to clicks back then. So I would go, it starts slow, mid, mid might be fast, slow down again, really fast at the end. I did the whole song, all of these songs, tempo map exactly to the original. And all of a sudden, my songs were flying off the shelf like pancakes because everyone knew that if you went to Ken Tamplin, he would give you exactly what you're looking for, okay? So the point of the moral of the story is, is give them what they're looking for. Don't try to shove your art down their throat. Very, very important. Let's talk a little bit about uh, cover bands and also about cruise ship stuff. Now, the cruise ship thing is really cool, and I can post that here, and it's in the description take either now or it will be at the end of the stream, is that you can find killer gigs. On, the cruise ships are looking all over the place for good talent. Now, you have to have a stomach for wanting to be on the road or on the, on the ocean for three months at a time. It's just like touring. And you also have to be part of the crew. You can't just be a rock star. You're actually part of the crew, and they you know, let you know that. But you get... Here's what's amazing. I can't tell you how many students I've gotten gigs on cruise ships. And the most interesting ones are the ones that had college tuitions they had to pay back. Here's why that's interesting. It covers all of your medical, all of your rent, you get a room, all of your food and travel, and you get paid. So they're able to take basically 100% of this money to pay back student loans while they're traveling the world, and many of them have done it within two and three years because 100% of their income goes towards paying back their loan, and then the rest of it is just gratis, and they go on and they travel the world on a cruise ship, okay? Now, cover bands are kind of interesting because there's a lot of them, and I'm, in fact, uh, Bob, um, I hope you can put this in the description tag too, uh, of gig masters and other places where if you do have a good cover band, you can also get great gigs usually playing you know higher end things like high end weddings and stuff like that and you think yeah i don't want to play a wedding i want to play a club well mix it up a little bit no one's asking you to sentence yourself to playing weddings however um there's uh, i'm going to give you some good information on that don't brightzilla's out there don't have your lead singer be hotter than the person getting married and i kid you not so don't go out there and like you know you're there to support the wedding and you don't want to upstage number one, which is the bride. Really important stuff. I made the mistake. It's really important. 
And you want to have quality and you want to make sure that you're providing something that is what they're looking for. So you can have a set list that you worked on. They get to choose the songs, et cetera, et cetera. But you could pull down a couple thousand dollars a gig doing this and everyone gets 500 bucks, a four piece band. Not a bad night for day's wage. And some of them will, you know, include the sound system and all your food and they treat you well and they recommend you, you know, so not a bad gig. So anyway, so these are a few ways that we can do this. Now, another great, I want to get back to the music publishing part of this. To this very day, I almost wish I had a, a way to show you. I guess I don't want in front of me. Um, when I place songs in film and television, to this very day, I get about $1,000 to $1,500 a month in residual income. And I haven't done it now for nine years, 10 years, I think it's been, but it's been ongoing residual income just from songs I've placed that get used over and over again in film and television. And how I did it was guys that were popular like Moby or Fatboy Slim or whomever is I just created music. I didn't plagiarize them, but I just created music that was similar to what they did. And I gave it over to a reputable, and I mean reputable publishing company. This is really, really important because you can get over to give it over to somebody else. And I've had that happen horribly early on in my career where they used it and they sold it in blocks of whether it had thousands of artists and they got all the money and we got very little, you know, kind of like Spotify where you get your check for 25 cents. But but I have Riptide is the person the company that I use. Um, they used to be called um, uh, pig factory music and they've had a couple different name changes but they're now called riptide and they've been very good to me and very credible and they just deposit the money into my account i don't do anything i just created good art that was in the likeness of things i knew they were looking for or things that i knew that were in the market would sell and i just put it out there and every month i get this check you know and i don't even need that check shame on me but it's nice to know i was acknowledged for the work i did back then and, and I put it out there. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you guys about, and I know that we can cover a lot in this subject, but I want to get to some of the questions and stuff, and I want to get some interaction from you. Um, this teaching, you know, I never thought of myself as a teacher, um, though I realized that as I was uh, in a lot of bands over the years, I wound up teaching a lot of, especially guitar players and drummers and bass players, um, how to do background vocals. And so it had never dawned on me that I was actually kind of educating myself for a time when I'd have to run into a lot of very tough issues of teaching people how to sing um, and getting them into, you know, uh, singing stuff that I was uh, singing play. Uh, so push them to their limits. And then I never knew that that would parlay into me teaching now uh, through YouTube. And YouTube is an awesome source. Facebook's pretty decent. You know, Instagram, you know, kind of sort of, but you can, you can build a career teaching also and and there's no shame in that and still then do other things playing cover bands and place you know push for songs from music and film and television so there's no one uh panacea no one thing that's you know gonna one size fits all we work at a lot of different angles to see what takes off for us there's also placing songs of your artistry and i've had a lot of success with this in fact kiss is an example where I pitched songs to major artists and they went, wow, we really like this. We're going to do it. So yes, I have songs on Kiss records and things like that. Um, so there's lots of avenues and ways of going around about doing this. So let's open up some questions here. So yeah, Rich Ezra and you're, you spell, um, Hodzik Eden, you spelled his name correctly, R-I-C-H-E-Z-R-A. And it's called the Film and TV Music Registry, I think. Look it up, Google it. Rich is a great guy and I highly recommend getting, uh, anything they put out is, is grade A. Um, in fact, I'm not, I may not even have supposed to have mentioned that because it's an industry resource. And they really want only people that are in the industry to use it. So it's just, you know, yeah, I'm just going to leave it at that. So um, I have, let's see, how's it, uh, Eden? I have songs that I want to play somewhere so that people who make movies can hear them. Can you recommend some pages? Yeah, I just did uh, the music registry. You go on. But again, we're not looking to shove our art down people's throat because we think it deserves to be in a movie, we need to find out what the movie is looking for. It's really important. 
So if it's a gangster movie and they want, you know, you know, they want some Italian piece, you're going, she get it done, she get it done, she get it done, or you know, some crazy thing. They're not looking for that. They're looking for spaghetti westerny sort of Italian, you know, gangster casino music. And then you have to say, well, do I have anything like that? Or could I write something like that? Okay. What's the next question we got here? Um, oh, you lost your stream. Sorry about that, Sammy. Uh, Stephen 112, besides becoming a good singer, what other ways to make money in music? I'm an electronics tech working at a casino, and I'd love to get out of there and make a living in the music industry. Well, actually, um, I had, when my son, we did a lot of soccer, and I got to meet a lot of uh we had the benefit of being in LA too. So that helps a lot. Uh, but you're at a casino. So I'm assuming you may be in Las Vegas or something. Um, you know, you can use all kinds of programs. Trust me, Moby, fat boy, slim. What's the other guy that's uh, real popular. Um, um, super, super popular. Anyway, it lists all these other artists. Anyway, oh, he's a DJ. You, you know, you can take, excerpts of things or there's a lot of music out there that's in public domain and there's a lot of things loops out there that you can get um uh, east west is a good company by loops from and you can create your own music and submit it and and that's actually the kind of stuff that gets placed a lot and it has regular um repeat uh plays for different uh, feature films and stuff and tv shows so uh yeah just get out there and start making some music and sending it out but i'd recommend to at least contacting a couple good quality publishing companies like Riptide, where they'll work for you. They're going to split it with you. They're going to take a good chunk of your change, but it's worth it because they're plugged in. They pay you. They make sure you get paid and they're hustling and they go, Oh, I've got this, you know, this uh, genre over here. In fact, at some point I may even post like a lot of different types of music that I've done. Cause I'm not, I'm a, I'm not a one dimensional kind of guy. I've done a lot of different things. So, um, and I've had to, in order to be able to uh, find my own path to success. So what else we got in here? It says, now that the industry is more stream based than a digital sales, do you think there is more emphasis on touring merch and diversifying? Well, that is, and isn't true. Um, by the way, that was from Brioni Faith Hawaii. You're in Hawaii. Awesome. Or just say hi. Um, anyway, um, um, Streaming is predominantly for listening and you can't use a stream unless you're doing something surreptitious to pull that in to a movie soundtrack. They need digital content. So you could stream something so that you listen to it, but you're still going to have to deliver a, a digital mechanism to give them um, what they need. Next one is fruit fanboy is having a large social media presence, more important than the actual content nowadays. What's the question then? I don't understand the question. He's just, it's he's just, it's just, okay. Um, well, um, there's both, <laughs> you know, content is king in the end. Um, personalities are another thing. Um, but remember what your goal is, is your goal is to take, uh, have, have the most timeless things that you can create and solicit them and put it out there that people can see and, 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 and do pound the pavement, do the work. Let me let me show, let me tell you something utterly ridiculous. This is utterly ridiculous. Are you ready for this? I'm not trying to discourage you, but I'm just going to tell you my story so you can do with this whatever you want. I was a Christian music artist. I am a Christian, but I was doing Christian music art, uh, art for a long time. I have three double awards and 14 nominations, and you know, did that thing for a long time. Toured a lot. And um, that's when I started to get into film and television because when my kids were born, I didn't want to leave them without a dad. So I decided to stay home, do music from home, and then do small tours and things like that so I could be close to my kids because I love them and I wanted to be in their life. Well, um, so I had a fax machine that I bought. And there was, it was Billboard's um, Guide to Publishers, I think it was called, Billboard Magazine. They, and I think they still offer it, a paperback version. And what I did was I put together a cover letter and I sent out two thousand faxes not once not twice not three times but four times i ran up a two thousand dollar phone bill that was back when phones were more expensive when you had to like all and for all over the world by the way not just us and all i got out of it hear me out on this 
All I got out of it was someone from a company called Transition Music. His name was Doug Stebbleton. Call me back and said, hey, I'd like to hear your stuff. So I drove it down there and I gave him my stuff. And he goes, wow, this stuff is really great. Hey, would you be interested in going to a meeting with me with a guy named Mark Berger? And Mark Berger just happened to be the uh, head legal counsel for Warner Brothers, who had done a lot of stuff. In fact, Mark was so powerful, he did. He signed David Bowie and he signed the Eagles and he signed like all these crazy bands. Okay. He was at a company at that time called Morgan Creek Films. And there was a uh, Jonathan Taylor Thomas film. It was the kid in tool time. I don't know if you remember that or not. Anyway, <laughs> but so uh, he, I went down there and there was already a composer on the gig. And, but I had my own studio. And so the question was, Hey, we want to do Susie Q from Creedence Clearwater and, and Whammer Jammer from Jay Giles band. Do you think you could do this? And, and, uh, the composer said, I already gave you, you know, this, this uh, music. And Mark Berger said, yeah, you gave us an electronic version of this music, but we're looking for something real and real drums. I go, I can record real drums. I can record real guitars. So they gave me the gig and I won and I got both songs placed in that, that movie. You can check it out. It's uh, called um, uh, America, Wild America. That's the name of it. Wild America. And so I have these two pieces placed in this film. And that started was the open door that got me in with Mark Berger and Transition Music, where I was able to take my entire catalog of a couple 300 songs and get these songs little by little placed in film and television. Now it didn't happen overnight. It took about a year to get them, you know, because films take a long time to, uh, to make and a lot of decision-making process, you know, like when I did Adam Sandler, The Water Boy, I mean, six months of, you know, when I did Ace Ventura, it was like a minute spot, it took us three weeks just to get one minute of music done. So sometimes it's arduous and whatever, but in the end, I got to do music for a living. And here I stand today and I continue to get to do music for a living. So let's take on the next question. Sorry, I probably should go quicker on these, but um, I want you to hear the backdrop of what it takes to get some of this stuff done. So what do we got? Uh, Lex Law, uh, how do you focus on singing from, uh, from while playing an instrument? Uh, play bass. Okay, so um, I have a video on YouTube. Uh, please check it out. It's called uh, How to Sing and Play Guitar at the Same Time. Start there. I have a whole section in my singing course on this. So you actually have to count beats. Um, so you're like one, two, three, four, down it, down it. Uh, uh, so you memorize them as two separate components. You start with the groove, you get the groove in your mind, you get your instrumentation together, and then you see where the hits of the vocals happen relative to the instrumental pushes. Sometimes it's hard, sometimes it's easy. A lot of times, like in cases like ACDC or, or even, um, gosh, bands like um, Little River Band or, you know, older bands like where there's a lot of push and pull, Stevie Wonder, you know, um, Sir Duke, for example, you got to really work at it. You memorize where the rhythm is, you put the rhythm in it, you practice that a lot, and then you memorize where the vocal comes in, and then you uh, syncopate that and juxtapate that. But I have a video on YouTube on that. Check it out. I also have this in my singing course. Uh, what else we got here? Um, so if I send my song to Riptide, they won't steal it. Well, okay, uh, good question. Copyright it. Copyright it. Bob, can you pull down a form PA and and and, and maybe make a, um, uh, I don't know if you can do GIF file. We can't, I guess we can't do GIFs in, in go, go online, go to the copyright office in, in Washington, DC. It's called form PA. It's super simple to fill out. It's like 30 bucks for your song or whatever. Once that's filled out, you own the song. And it's pretty, a very easy process. Um, no one is going to be dumb enough to try to say, steal your song unless they try to change it and rearrange it in a way that's kind of unrecognizable. But if they, if, if they're, they're not in the business of doing that. It would have to be a band that does it or another writer that does it. Publishing companies don't create music. Publishing companies distribute and promote music. So if you have a good publishing company, they will, they're looking to make money with you, not looking to steal it from you. So uh, next one is Brian Edward. Uh, how would one get started in doing music for film? Well, I just said that. Like, so what I did, uh, first thing I did 
I did something really stupid, guys. Let me confess something to you. Um, way back when I first wanted to start doing this, it was, I think, 1991 or two. It was a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie called Lionheart. Or, and then in Europe, it was called AWOL. It changed the name. And um, the music supervisor, his name is Derek Power. And he's a very powerful guy. And he now manages, like, the biggest composers in the world. And, you know, he'd come to the studio and he wanted a certain song done a certain way. And it was my way or the highway. No, this is my art. And I, I, I can't compromise that. I won't do this. And I won't do that. Well, he put up with me and both songs did end up into the movie, but he never worked with me again. Even later in life, when I had a really big come, gig come up and he knew that I'd have been good for the gig, he just decided not to work with me because he thought I was too much of a pain. I was too much too ego, egoed out and, you know, my own artistry. He had no idea how much, how more um, malleable I had become since the time we'd first started working together. So the goal is, like I said, to get out that book from Rich Ezra, the film and TV buyer's guide, I think it's called, go through it and look up the music supervisors in the book, email them, call them and say, hey, what are you looking for? I have this kind of, you know, this sound or I can produce this kind of music. What films are you work, working for? Now, there's another way you can do it. It's a little more arduous, but it's worthy. Is you can get out the Hollywood Reporter. And in the back of the Hollywood Reporter, I think they still do this. Or there's several magazines that do this. They list all the movies that are in production. And you look at them and you go, okay, this is a period piece from the 1700s. Or this is a Western. Or this is a, a spy movie. Or this is whatever. And then they usually list the music supervisor that's in the movie. They won't give you his name don't you, or number, but they'll, the name will be listed. Then you go back to your Rich Ezra Byers guy and you go, oh, it's Rick Rubin. And here's his contact info. And you call up Rick and you say, hey, Rick, I mean, I think I've got something really cool for you. And then he may or may not listen. He might be annoyed because he gets a lot of calls and you've got to be very classy and make your point. But I did some absolutely crazy things, guys, to get in, in the door of some of these guys. One, one example is I had, I was trying, sorry, his name is John McCullough. And I don't know if he's still doing uh, uh, as a music director, uh, music supervision. But uh, there was a, a TV show called, what was it? It was based in Alaska, North something. Uh, I think, think of the name in a minute. Uh, Northern Lights or something, I forget. Anyway, and I just, he just wouldn't take my call. And so uh, he had made a comment. He goes, um, why should I, why should I want to listen to your music? So I went down to a secondhand store. I used to live in Long Beach at the time and have these like cool, um, you know, uh, antique slash, you know, junk shops. So you could buy stuff, right? And I bought a really beautiful bustier of a woman's head. And it was like up to here. And I cut it square in the center and I put a copy of my CD in it and I put it in a box. And I said, you know, because my music is head and shoulders above the rest. And he laughed so hard when he got it. He thought it was creepy. But he laughed so hard that I got to work with John. I had another another guy, um, a, 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 was actually a writer, Desmond Child. And, and, and he goes, I write on all my own stuff. He goes, there's no way you're going to get your music into my office. That's what he said. There's no way you're going to get your music into my office. So I bought, uh, I went to a, a, a um consignment store and I bought this big combat boot and I put it in a box and I, I federal expressed it to him. And I said, now that I've got my foot in the door, <laughs> I had my CD in the center because he told me there's no way I could get my music in his thing. I had another, I could go on and on and on, but there was this other guy. Uh, I probably shouldn't name him because he's still really big. So I won't name him. But he said to me, he goes, you don't seem to understand. I just don't have the time for you. And I'm like, what is it going to take to get you just to listen to one thing that I do? He goes, you don't seem to understand. Stop calling me. I just don't have time for this. I went down to the store. I bought Minute Maid orange juice, instant nails, uh, uh, with super glue, dry quick super glue, and all these things. And I put it in a box and I sent him... I hope that by using these products bought you five minutes out of your day to listen to my CD. And he laughed so hard. He goes, 
dude, you're in. So I was able to get in like in stupid, silly kinds of ways. So we have to be creative. If you're really a creative person, you can come up with creative ways of doing stuff. And that happens to be, you know, extremes. And by the way, I had a lot more things like that that I sent out. Some worked, some didn't. Some people got upset, you know, but I got enough contacts out of it to work my way in, wiggle my way in and um, be able to be successful at doing that. So what's, what's our next question here? By the way, I enjoy being with you guys and talking with you. And um, again, apologies for being late. We're going to do this every Saturday. We're going to try to do a pickup on, on Wednesdays at the same time. So um, it's going to be on Saturday and on Wednesday. And we're going to pick up all kinds of extraordinary subjects. And we're going to go through all of the comments and uh, you know pick out the ones we think are most relevant, particularly for each segment. Uh, and continue to go from there. So we'll see. Uh, do you do your own production? EG compression? Yes, absolutely. I'm a monster engineer. By the way, the question, sorry, was from Dave from CM. Is that Costa Mesa? Um, do you do your own production, EG compression equalization, or do you hire someone? Is this hard to learn? Well, there's a lot of answers to, to that question. I'm old school, and I took pride in uh, making great records. And that's a very long, hard, arduous road, arduous road. And I have gear that also accommodates that. But now there are so many great plugins if you're using Pro Tools or something where you can pretty much use a decent plugin and play with it a little bit. And it'll give you, I don't want to say 50% of what you're looking for, but enough uh, to make you're not having to spend 20 years learning how to be a great audio engineer. Um, I will say that I did have the benefit of working with Mick Guzowski, look him up. You probably guys probably know him from uh, uh, the Get Lucky album from Daft Punk. Um, you know, working with Robin Thicke. You know, uh, he also did Earth, Wind, and Fire. He also did Denise Williams. He also did Diana Ross. I mean, like crazy, crazy guys. I got to work with him for a year. Um, I got to work with Eddie Kramer, who did Led Zeppelin. Um, I got to work with uh, Andy Johns, who did Led Zeppelin. I got to work with Dieter Dirks, who did The Scorpions. Um, I mean, I could go on and on and on about all the producers I got to work with over the years. So I have some serious chops when it comes to recording. And I know what gear gives me what it is that I need. But that doesn't mean you guys have to go through that arduous process. Because let's be candid, most people don't care that much anymore. If it sounds like Pro Tools, they're happy. So um, my suggestion is just familiarize yourself with good plugins. Use them. See what how they'll work for you. Next question is uh, uh, from... Coru L. Arte de Renavorkar, something. Sorry if I didn't get your name right. Uh, do you think to start in my 30s is too late to make it in the music world? Do I think that you're going to become Ariana Grande? No. Do I think that you could certainly uh, work your way into making a living doing music? Absolutely. So I don't know to what level you're looking to make it. If you're looking to be a superstar, it's going to be pretty tough if you didn't start a bit earlier. Not to say you can't do it, but you're late on the draw. Can you make a good living doing it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Next question. Uh, what we got here? Uh, from Land of Dracula. Okay. Should I attend a music conservatory and try to have a musical career uh, that can be very hard in my country uh, or study something else at university and keep music as a backup? Okay, that's a big, uh, you're not going to like the answer I'm about to give you, but I'm going to give it to you anyway, because I care. I hate conservatories. Let me say it again. I hate conservatories. Um, I don't want to get sued, so I'm not going to tell you where I was when I did this, but I was at a very, very prominent, and I mean world-renowned prominent uh, film composition conservatory for classical music out of New York. And the professor showed us around the wall, you know, Brahms and Liszt and Beethoven and Bach and Mozart and all those things. And the first thing he said to me was us, there was about 50, 60 people in the room, 60, 70 people, a lot of Asians. And he said, you will never be as good as these guys, ever. Our goal, if we're lucky, by the time we finish this four-year course, for you to get to 10% of their greatness, and even that, he doubted it. And I thought to myself, you are sentencing me 
not only just to copy these guys and, and, and be a carbon copy of them, but you're not giving me any room for improvisation. And I thought to myself, as a seasoned musician at this time, no wonder you guys can't solo. I really mean it. Get a classical guy to come out who's been indoctrinated into that kind of thought and get him to solo. It's laughable. Get him to do a blues lick. Instead of a lick going, they'll go, right? They're so stiff and there's no, no true improvisation. I walked out of the class and I'm better for it. And, and, and yes, if you're needing a security blanket to show credentials that you went through this school or that school, and I've got all kinds of credentials, my credential is my voice and my playing and, and what I can produce. But if you feel like you need that, go ahead and waste four years of your life and spend 40 or 50 or 60 or $70,000 or whatever that college charges you. You're better off as an artisan going to people that are excellent at what they do to show you the ropes of how to get good at what you do and not swallow the pink elephant of, you know, university. And by the way, I'm not the only person saying this. Now, this is coming out. I mean, you go to PragerView and you look at all these people and a lot of people going, you know, universities, man, for what you're going to end up spending to what you get out of it. And they're basically, most of them are burnt out social workers trying to teach people something that they don't even really know themselves. You're going to find that you're not going to get the information. You might get the certificate, but you're not going to get the information. And you're four years later with a debt and you're still not that much better. Me might be sight reading better and you might know music and read music better. But when it comes down to the actual application, mm -mm. okay, um, Leonardo, Limos, what's the best way to start a career with covers or with your own songs? Well, those are two different things. Uh, like I said, you know, everyone's path is different. Everyone's country is different. But I showed you, you know, put some stuff up on YouTube even just to kind of get a feel for what people think of your stuff. Some people are mean and they say stupid stuff. And then other people are encouraging. Get a lay of the land. Try to, uh, you know, find, find um, like I said, good quality information. Like I gave you, you know, this uh, music registry, you know. Holy cow, phenomenal resource. Um, you, there's a company, like I said, called Taxi and there are other ones where they say, hey, we'll place your music and film and television. They're just trying to take your money. They're, they don't, they place squat and they take people's money. Um, but there are other good companies out there. Like I said, you know, start pitching some of your stuff to quality publishing companies. The music registry has an, a whole catalog of great publishing companies. Just get, make relationships, get to know people, get to know what they're looking for. If you're a country artist, you pitch to country artists. If you're a rock guy, you could pitch, pitch to uh, rock guys and so forth. So that, that would be my recommendation. So what else we got? Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. It is Joshua Hart. Question. Hart question. Joshua Hart. Uh, why do professors who teach voice at universities like rock? Uh, why don't like, don't like rock? Excuse me. Why are they all opera? Why don't they consider rock part of the beauty of voice? That's a good question, man. Um, there's a lot to that answer, but I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version. The first part of the answer is, is that rock is an extreme sport and it's not for the weak at heart. And so what happens is, is anything that is not opera. And by the way, this is true even down to vowel sounds, vowel modifications. By the way, it's called appoggio or it's called bel canto. So let's use those two terms. So, so in bel canto, if you don't sing it exactly the way they want it, you're anathema, you're accursed. Which makes it interesting because Italian opera and their vowel sounds are different than Swedish opera and their vowel sounds and French opera and their vowel sounds and Argentine opera and their vowel sounds. Okay, I'm using some spectrum here and you can take this all the way to Southeast Asia and some other places. So they're very snooty when it comes to having it exactly like what they think it's. Let me give you a quick example of this. I, I'm not prepared to sing a lot today. I haven't even warmed up yet. So, but I'm gonna show you some things here. If I take an ah, uh, the, the five vowels that are in opera, ah, uh, eh, e, oh, and oo, those are the only vowels you're allowed to sing, right? 
Now, in, in the English language, including diphthongs, there's 16 different vowel sounds, up to 32 with the diphthongs themselves, or how we translate from one vowel to another, and we don't sing them classically, brokely, very dark and covered, or, uh, you know, cover meaning dark sounding. So if I were to go, alone, it's really, alone. How am I going to apply that to pop and rock? They're good for placement, and it's really good to maintain open throat technique. But what we want to do is we want to translate those vowels. And I cover all of this in my singing course, guys. I take that sound because I believe in it. The, the mechanism is awesome, but it needs to be expanded way beyond what bel canto has um, imprisoned everyone into thinking that that's the only way to sing. So, oh, because, ha, and, oh, ha, ha, a, a, e, and o is o, and o is o. Okay, so I convert those sounds using the same space in the throat and the same support mechanism to contemporize the sound in order to make it great or acceptable to a, a pop rock environment. Here's where it gets a little dicey. There should never be any stress in your throat at any time, and if you do, you're killing yourself. Well, truth be told, rock is an extreme sport. So I go, hey, yeah, 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 yeah. Like I'm, I'm distressing the chord because I want to get that sound, right? But so what I need to do, and like I said, I covered this in my course. This isn't something you're going to get out of my YouTube videos because it's a whole process. You've got to go through the process to do this safely. I take the vowels and we work the vowels and get resonance, greater and greater resonance out of the sound, like I did in last week's memory. And then I leaned into a little more. And I leaned into a little bit more. And, and all of a sudden resonance takes over and it becomes a bigger sound. So what we do is we grow the voice, strengthen the voice to do that. And as we lean into it, we can apply this grit and distorted pressure to give us the effect that we're looking for. The caveat to this is we must come back and clean up the voice the very next day, or we forever sentence ourselves to a distorted, gritty tone. And we want to get layers and flavors in different colors of this. Next question. And we're about to close it up here, guys. So uh, it's from Slayer. Do you recommend pitching yourself to artists who are, have already made it uh, or companies, labels themselves? Both, actually. Both. Yeah. Now, again, if you think you have a song that's great for Slayer <laughs> or whomever, um, you know, make sure it sounds like something they do and make sure that you're, um, the way that you present your art isn't a, a 20 long paragraph thing and how great you are this way. Go straight to the point and say, this is what I think you guys are looking for. It's like your last album, which was blah, 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 with a little twist. If you guys take a little listen, uh, I think you guys might find it's, it's interesting. Now, there are some pluggers, which is, like I said, Transition Music, and there's other companies out there. I don't recommend Transition Music, by the way, anymore. Uh, but I do recommend, uh, you know, uh, Riptide. They're great. Um, and or other companies like that. And you can go online and, and look and see, and there's a lot of information out there. But And I've posted some here. In fact, I've, I've, in the description tag, you're going to see guys that I've used that have been reputable, um, is you can present to them their sound or something like their sound. And due diligence, guys, don't present them crap. Get out a decent piece of gear or get it recorded in a way that they can hear it because you're going to get disqualified um, if they can't get the one-two punch of how you want it to come across, that's really important. Okay, I'm going to do one more question, and then we're going to revisit these questions. And again, I'm going to be on this coming Wednesday at 9 p.m. Uh, is it Pacific Daylight? Uh, 9, 9, 9 p.m., 9 a.m., sorry, uh, in the morning, 9 in the morning, Los Angeles time, this coming Wednesday, and then again next Saturday. So I'm going to try to keep this coming so I can help uh, field and answer questions. And in the interim... Um, I'm going to um, uh, uh, take the questions that we have here and probably start off the session 
answering the questions first and then going into the content. And I got some really cool for you guys uh, on Wednesday. So stay tuned with me on that. But last question, here we go. Uh, JMax10 says, can I learn to sing well with your course if I don't have a coach to correct me? Can I reach a very good level of your course or do I need something to correct me? Well, that's actually why I created the forums. You know, I've got my assistants, Bob, and I've got, you know, other guys in there that are helping out. So if you can't afford the gold bundle, which includes three sessions with me, you could just get the course, go into the forums, post your music, and you get uh, almost real-time feedback. I mean, it's really great. So um, that's why I created the forums. I wouldn't recommend going to another coach because they're not going to teach you what I'm going to teach you. And it'll be like trying to learn two different languages at once, Chinese and Ken Tamplin Italian. So stick with it. Stick with volume one for a while. Don't race through it. There's no reason for it. Post some things in the forums, get good feedback. And then maybe at some point along the line, you may want to take a lesson with me. By the way, I'm not uh, soliciting lessons because I'm kind of winding out from that and I want to give more um, scoptic information for a lot of people. So I'm not doing one-on-one -on -one stuff so much. I will do it and I'm happy to do it, but I'm just saying I'm providing other great resources to be able to help you guys uh, do the course. So you can absolutely do the course, go into the forums, get killer information, watch what everyone else has been doing, see how they've resolved their issues. It'll really help you. Anyway, God bless you guys. Um, good to see you. And um, until Wednesday, uh, we'll see you guys next this coming week. So cheers. Peace out.